Chapter 17, Nightmare. Inside the house, I don't find anyone in the living room, upstairs, kitchen, or dining room. I decide to check the basement next, and then work my way up. The door to the basement is heavy, with an old-fashioned doorknob, quite possibly original to the house. It opens noiselessly on well-oiled hinges. The basement has obviously been renovated recently, despite the old door. The stairwell is enclosed with metal handrails. I flip the light switch and realize that the chance of anyone being down there is slim, since the lights have been off. Out of curiosity, I follow the steps down to where they turn to the right. The basement isn't very large. It opens up into one room. It must not run the whole length of the house. Directly ahead of me is the kitchenette setup. Three refrigerators or large freezers are lined up on the wall to my left, then a sink just past them in the corner. Around the corner, bordering the sink, is an oven. A few cabinets and an island counter round out the set. The rest of the basement is a nicely furnished room with a living room feel. There aren't any windows, but there's a door on the wall to my right. I'd like to check if it leads outside or to another room, but remembering my mission, I realize I've taken too much time on this diversion already. It's a nice basement, but I've got monsters to corral. I head back up the stairs and through the familiar downstairs rooms. I decide to knock on the lab door in case they aren't there. That would end my search sooner, as well as prevent the need for knocking on bedroom doors. That seems a little too nosy for me, even under the current circumstances. The lab door, in contrast to the basement door, is very modern and made of metal. It's painted white, perhaps to make its composition less noticeable from a distance, but my knuckles can tell, and the muffled sound my knocking makes is a dead giveaway. I knock and wait. I can't hear anyone or anything inside, so I knock again and count to 15. Hello? The voice comes from upstairs. I think it's Mark. I realize now that I haven't yet come up with a story for why I need to gather everyone. Better think quickly. Hi, Mark? I ask. Yes, Mark replies. It's Eric. Duh. Where is everyone? I ask. Mark is down to the bend in the stairs now, and I look up at him. Arlene and Frank are in with your parents, making observations. Tom is around somewhere, I believe. I don't think he has left for the slaughterhouse yet. Doesn't usually go this early on Saturdays. I'm just doing some reading. I thought I heard knocking, so I came out into the hallway. Yeah, I was just looking for Dr. Sutton and figured I'd check down low before going up the stairs. I thought maybe she was in the lab. Nope, no one is in there at the moment. Thanks, Mark. I guess I'll just head up to see Dr. Sutton then. Okay, that'll be fine, Mark says and begins climbing the stairs. I jump, I jump up the stairs two at a time and catch up with him. Actually, I've got something I'd like to talk to everyone about. Do you think you could find Tom and bring him up? I ask, trying not to betray my flash flood of anxiety and hoping that Mark doesn't ask for details or ask if I'd like to involve Rachel in my discussion as well. He doesn't seem suspicious. Sure, I'll see if he's in his bedroom and bring him up. Got some more questions about your new life, eh? Yeah, still trying to figure out, the, figure this all out. Thanks. Sure, sure. Mark says as we walk side by side down the hall towards the next staircase. Mark stops at the last door and knocks. I continue on up the stairs, concerned that Tom might be able to read my expression and become suspicious of my request for a grand counsel. Tom answers the door, and I hear Mark explaining my request as I set foot onto the third level floor. The door to my room, to the room my parents are in is open slightly. I approach quietly, but don't hear anything from inside. I knock lightly on the door frame and step inside. Hello, Eric. <laughs> Hello, Eric, says Dr. Sutton. That comma really got me right there. Hello, Eric, says Dr. Sutton. Frank looks up at me from the rocking chair and then back down to the clipboard and papers in his hands. Clearly, I'm not very interesting to him at the moment. If only he, if he only knew what I was about to do. Actually, it's definitely better that he doesn't know. This phrase isn't, very, this phrase isn't really useful in a situation like this. I wonder when it would be useful. What's up, Doc? If I'm going to die for good in a few minutes, I don't want it to be without ever having said that to an official doctor. Quite, Dr. Sutton says. Is she suddenly British? Do you need something, or were you just coming up to visit your parents, she adds. I was hoping I could have a chat with everyone. I saw Mark downstairs. He's going to see if he can bring Mr. Sutton up. I have some life as a reanimate questions, and I wanted to get everyone's perspectives on it, I say. Frank looks up again and eyes me studiously for a moment before going back to his papers. Very well. We can have a little session with you, the doctor says. Mark and Tom Sutton enter the room. Mark makes for the only other open chair in the room, a simple straight-backed wooden chair, probably part of a dining room set at some point. Tom leans against the wall right inside the door. He speaks first. Good morning, Eric. You have some questions? Yes, I do. Probably not very scientific, but some things I thought up overnight. Does anyone mind answering my questions? I try to play it off as casual and be extra polite. All I need to do is buy some time. I hope Rachel has everything under control outside. If this doesn't go according to plan, not that we really have much of a plan, things could get pretty dicey. Tom shrugs in response to my question. Mark says he doesn't mind. Frank says nothing. What's on your mind? Dr. Sutton asks. Well, first, just a few stupid but curious questions. I still don't have any questions. 
that was okay. He says, well, first, just a few stupid but curious questions, and then he's thinking, I'm not good at this reading stuff still. I haven't gotten better. I thought I might, but that's better. Okay, so he th his thoughts. I still don't have any questions. Time to ad-lib. Now he's talking again. Will my hair continue growing? Will I need to shave and get haircuts? Tom says, hmm, while blowing air out his nose. That's an interesting question. I don't think I wondered about that myself until a few months after the transition, and I realized I hadn't had a haircut since. Good. He seems to be taking the question seriously and isn't raising suspicion. Hair still grows, but significantly slower than it did before for you. A good haircut will last a lot longer now. It's a good benefit, Dr. Sutton says. Of course, a bad haircut. Tom lets silence finish his remark, which has the intended effect. We laugh. Okay, how about uh, bathroom stuff? You said I can eat whatever I want. My body will process it. Is digestion the same as before? Just doesn't absorb nutrients the same? I ask. I do wonder about these things, but it doesn't matter if I find out the answers now, as I expect we'll all be dead in short order. I hope we will be. What have you eaten in the last few days? Dr. Sutton asks. I guess since Wednesday lunch, I haven't eaten anything except for the dish of brains you brought me. When, when was that, yesterday? I had a little water at some point. Right, so in four days, you haven't eaten much or had anything to drink, but do you feel hungry? Have you felt the urge to visit the restroom? Dr. Sutton asks. No, I feel fine. So I won't go to the bathroom anymore? I say. Not as often, but you will. We have delved into the science of it a little. If you'd like to get deeper into it at some point, we can do that. But I assume right now you just have some entry-level curiosity. Right, I'm just curious. Maybe someday we can get into the science behind it all. But that's good enough for now, I say. I have a question for you, says Frank. Taken by surprise, I say. Okay, shoot. Why are you wasting our time with these questions? No one says anything. Either they are all thinking this, or zombies don't have patience for eager learners. I don't mind. It opens the door to ask the one question I'm actually interested in knowing the answer to. Well, I have one big question I want to ask, but didn't know how to go about getting everyone together in order to ask it. I was trying to work up to it, but I don't want to waste anyone's time, so I'll just ask it. I pause a moment. As much to kill time as to phrase the question in my mind. What do you all intend to do with this virus? Why have you spent these last three years researching it in secret, and why are you now doing human trials with it? I ask. Tom chuckles and stands upright from his leaning position on the wall. He walks towards the one window in the room, which has been blocked by curtains thus far. I begin to sweat, though not physically. I don't know if that's possible, but in my mind I'm sweating. I sure hope Rachel isn't in view of this window, wherever that might be. Or if she's already started the fire, I hope the smoke and flames aren't visible here. Tom stops short of the window and turns back to face me. That's convenient. You must have a theory yourself, Eric, otherwise you wouldn't ask this question. The cowboy says coolly. I look at Dr. Sutton, who is waiting for my response. Frank and Mark are also eyes on me. I don't have a theory. I'm just curious. You made me a zombie. You made my parents zombies. What's next? There must be a reason. I'm trying to figure it out. I guess if I have a theory, it's that you want to give this virus to everyone, but I don't understand why. That's what I'd like to know. Why? Tom nods slowly, but doesn't say anything. Dr. Sutton takes over. The virus doesn't make people into zombies. It reanimates their bodies. In the process, it eliminates a lot of what makes people weak. It doesn't make them immortal, but it does reduce their mortality. You will live longer than... longer like this than you could have could ever have hoped for without the virus. Many things that would have killed you before won't kill you now. They won't even hurt you. This is the next stage in human evolution. We are going to make the world stronger. You are the first. You are proof that this is possible, and over the next few weeks and months, we'll determine to what extent the benefits reach. This is historic. I say, but what about individual will and consent? You did this to me. I never asked for it. You didn't even offer me a brochure and have me consider the transition as an option. You just did it. What if I don't want to have reduced mortality? And what about the children or the really old? Do you want to give them the virus as well and trap them in extended states of childhood or old age? I feel my temper rising toward anger, but then it stops, and then it starts again. Dr. Sutton seems pleased to have these questions to contend with. Frank has put his papers down on the floor next to his chair and folded his hands in his lap. He is finally taking interest in my little meeting. Mark is also sitting attentively in his chair against the wall. My parents are both lying motionless in their beds. Dead? Reanimated? I have no idea. Tom Sutton is standing a few steps from the window, arms folded, smiling at me. To answer your last question first, the virus will kill the weak, the sick, the very young, and the very old. We aren't sure what the age brackets are, but we know that Rachel transitioned at 16 and Frank at 68. I suppose, in all honesty, we don't know that the virus will kill those groups, but we definitely expect it to. That is a hard process to recreate with rats, as their development is very different in matters of time than it is for humans. One of our associates during the accident that resulted in our transitioning did have young children, and they weren't looked and they weren't looking good during the transition. Our teammate didn't like the whole process and ended things for himself and his family, so we never got to see what would have happened for the children. It is too bad. 
As Dr. Sutton laments her mad scientist memory, I challenge her again. Then you are prepared to release a viral agent into the public that may instantly kill and not reanimate a huge portion of the population. Just like that? Yes. Yes, Eric. We are willing to kill a large portion of the population in order to improve things for an even larger portion of the population. That's our plan. Dr. Sutton seems frustrated with me, but she has admitted her evil intent yet again. Who died and left you in charge of the future of the human race? Can your virus-operated corpse bodies procreate? I match her frustration wit for wit. We don't need procreation. We will continue to exist, unbound and unfettered by the animal demands of life, almost completely. We will be able to focus on progression, free from needs to earn money and work ourselves to death just to survive. Education and enlightenment will take top priority and focus in the lives of the survivors. You're young, Eric. What do you know about the struggles that exist in the world? Dr. Sutton is in her full mad scientist element now. What do I know of the struggles of the world? What do you mean? Poverty? War? Famine? I seek to clarify. Yes, those things. What causes them? I'll tell you. Mortal weakness. The animal passions of the human race. If we eliminate those passions, we eliminate the problems that follow. We are providing peace and security, she explains. I still don't know if they are operating alone or on a larger scale, but it sounds like the super soldier theory is out. I suppose I'm not Captain America after all. I'm just a modern version of Frankenstein's monster. Unless I can pull this off, in which case I'll reinstate my Captain America status. But not, not for the super soldier bit, just for the heroics. I wonder how Rachel's fire is going out there. Maybe you are providing peace and security, but at what cost, I ask. What cost? The loss of sickness, weakness, and death, Frank answers. I turn to face him. Minus the initial death count, right? You have to break some eggs, he says. And all of you are in on this? Mark, Mr. Sutton, I ask. Yes, Mark says. Tom simply nods. Well, I wish I never got mixed up with you people. I'm not happy about how things have turned out, but I'm glad that Rachel brought me so I can stop you. I guess if it wasn't me here now, I'd eventually have faced the virus anyway. I'm glad then that it is this way so I can stop it. Tom laughs. Another big laugh like when I first met him a few days ago. You can't stop this boy. And he continues laughing. I smell smoke. Rachel has done it. Maybe I can't, not alone, not right now, but the stopping is already in motion. That doesn't make sense. The stopping is already in motion? Oh well. It's said. Can't take it back now. Tom's face goes blank and then fills with suspicious hostility. Where is Rachel? Dr. Sutton's eyes open so wide I half expect her eyeballs to fall out. She shrugs and answers Tom's question. Tom scowls at me and then comes charging in my direction. He grabs my collar with one hand and the other clenches around my left bicep. I'm slammed against the wall next to the door. With his face only an inch or so away from mine, he says, you can't stop us. I'm thrown to the side and I crumple into a heap when I hit the ground. Tom is out of the room and I can hear his steps pounding on the stairs before I can even lift myself back up. Frank is right out the door behind him, followed by Dr. Sutton. Mark is standing over me. What have you done, my boy? He asks. This isn't right. You can't expose people to a fatal virus like this. It's evil, I say. Evil is in the eye of the beholder, Mark says, right before kicking me square in the nose. I don't lose consciousness, but it is a minute or two before I can stand up. The smell of smoke is stronger now. The air in the room is becoming hazy. It's just me and my parents left in the room. They both lie as though dead. That's how I think of them otherwise. That's how I think of them, otherwise I might not be able to leave them. I struggle to stand. Without looking at the beds, I say goodbye and exit the room. There is much more smoke in the hallway. It's coming from the stairwell. I see no flames yet. I can't sense any increase in temperature. I don't know where the fire was started, but it seems to be going. I hope it destroys the lab. It is likely that everyone has gotten out. I hope Rachel gets away from them. The smell of the smoke stings in my brain, but I don't feel it in my throat or lungs as I should if I was alive. I'm re still reeling a bit from the head kick, which, by the way, was totally unexpected. It wouldn't have surprised me as much from Frank, but quiet Mickey Rooney? That caught me way off guard. The stairs are now covered with black smoke. I feel my way down to the next landing and drop to the floor in an effort to see beneath the smoke. Visibil visibility is low. I'm realizing that fire might not really have been as much of a captivating method as I originally thought. I wasn't figuring for how little physical effect the smoke has on me. I suppose the others have simply run right out the front door. Visibility is much better from the floor. I can stay down and crawl towards the next staircase. I start to feel the heat, a lot, the closer I get to the stairs. This end of the house is where the lab is. I guess Rachel started the fire here. Good. Hopefully that means the lab is destroyed. Even if we don't get the walking virus samples, we'll get the stuff in the lab. The heat is stifling. Maybe fire wasn't such a bad plan after all. I just lost my audience too soon. I'll have to rehearse better next time. Next time? There is no next time. This is it for me. I'm not going to attempt to make it down these stairs. I'll melt or burst into flames in the process. Zombie Eric might be able to withstand greater physical pain, but he isn't invincible. Do I just give up then? Just lie here on the floor until the flames consume me? 
If I'm not affected by smoke inhalation, it's likely to be a very painful process of succumbing to flames. I'm getting second thoughts about this plan. I think I'd rather take my chances getting out and having Tom rip my head off. Yes, that sounds more appealing than burning to death. I'm, ne I'm next to one of the bedroom doors, so I push through and find that the smoke hasn't filled this room extensively yet. I close the door behind me to maintain the clearer atmosphere. I spare no time in making my way to the window. I rip the curtains open and the rod pulls down with a violent tug. The window slides up and I kick out the screen. Sticking my head out, I feel the heat from the flames engulfing the house to my left. Flames are also starting up the right side of the structure. She either started fire on both ends or it is already wrapped around the front of the house. Lucky for me, there isn't any fire directly below this window. Neither is there any ground for a good 15 feet or so. I wonder if my bones are stronger as a zombie. This certainly isn't a fatal fall height, but that doesn't mean it isn't a bone-shattering height. I take a moment to look around the room. Maybe there's some mountain climbing equipment. No such luck, but it was worth the look. I tear off the bed sheets and try to wrap them into ropes. I tie the two together and somehow end up with a rope that seems shorter than, the one, of the, than one of the sheets alone. This isn't as easy as they make it look on television. I abandon this project as I realize I'll only get a foot or two of rope after tying it off to something inside the room. Those two feet might make a difference, but only if I'm going to break my legs on the straight fall. If I survive, it won't matter. Yeah, that's good rationalizing. I climb feet first out of the window and maintain a solid grip on the bottom sill. Sliding my feet down the siding, I hang flat against the wall. I can't look down, but it suddenly feels like I'm even higher than when I was looking down from inside the room. I can give myself another few inches by sliding my hands to the outer edge of the window. First with one hand, I slide it out <clears throat> and take the best grip I can with just my fingers on the outer edge of the window. There is a bit of a recess where the window pane seats into the frame. This provides something for me to hold on to. Next, I move the other hand out and successfully move myself six or so inches closer to the ground. That's it. I can't go any further, unless when superheated, my zombie body will stretch like rubber. Probably not, and I don't really want to wait to find out. The heat is pretty gnarly as it is. It's now or in another 15 seconds when my fingers give out. I think I want to be prepared for the fall, so I count to three and push off. Falling is a basic activity. It doesn't take much effort. Impacting the ground is another story. I land on my feet, but with a strong backward force that pulls me down into a seated position. On the way down, my face meets my knees, but only for a second before I roll onto my back and over my head. The end result is me lying face down in the grass with acute pain in my feet, ankles, knees, nose, tailbone, and neck. But it doesn't last. By the time I'm able to recover my wits, the pain is gone. Or rather, not gone, but simply a shadow of the initial pulse of it. Pushing myself up to rest on my knees, I look left and right. <clears throat> but no one is around. The flames in the house have reached the roof and are working their way towards the middle. The smoke is billowing into the sky, white in some spots, black in others, spiraling together like a mixed chocolate and vanilla soft serve cone for a bit, and then mixing into an indiscriminate gray fog. I look up to the window I jumped from. Okay, fell from, and it does look high. I critique my form and suppose I might have been better off turning to face out away from the house after pushing off from the wall. That way I could have hit the ground and transitioned to a, into a forward somersault. I've seen the guys do it on TV. I could have pulled it off. Maybe. I stand all the way up, and surprisingly, I feel all right. Looking left again, I see a gas can. That must be where Rachel ended the soak. I take an oblique path towards that, that end of the house, increasing the distance between the house and myself as the heat increases in intensity the closer I get to the end. I clear the corner of the house before I see anyone. It's a body, but I'm not sure who it used to belong to. My arc has to increase to get me further from the flames, but I continue towards the front corner of the house where the body is lying, uncomfortably close to the fire from my judgment. It's a short, stout body, which means it must be Frank or Mark. The car is gone from the driveway. I wonder if Rachel got away or if it was someone else. I pull my shirt up over my head and run to the body. The heat is unbearable. I get close enough only to confirm that it is Frank, but it's not close enough to determine what killed him. I assume he's dead. He wouldn't be able to stand the heat if he wasn't. But did he drop there because of the flames or by some other means? I run from the body straight toward the road. My eyes dart around in every direction, looking for any sign of Rachel or anyone else. But I see no one. Did the others get out of the house? Did the others get out and leave the car? Leave in the car? Are they running away from the house? Did they get trapped inside? Tom and Frank left the room upstairs first. If Frank is outside, it begs that Tom, Tom made it out, made it as well. Unless he stopped inside to get something. That's very possible. Maybe he didn't make it out. If Frank only made it that far before succumbing to the heat, perhaps Tom, Dr. Sutton, and Mark didn't even make it out of the house. That's only if Tom didn't get out the door first. My attention is pulled from wondering about the others by an exploding window on the second floor fire is definitely doing its job destroying the house. I wonder if my parents' remains will ever be found, and if they are, if they'll determine who they are. How will that reconcile with the story Dr. Sutton and her friends made up? Hey, are you alright? Again, my attention is jerked away from what I've been thinking about. This time the sound comes from behind me and is a voice. 
I spin around to find a man with a concerned expression leaning over from the driver's seat of an old pickup truck, yelling to me through the windowless passenger door. Son, are you okay? He repeats. Yes, I'm okay. A little in shock. Mentally, I guess, but I think I'm fine physically, I yell back. Get in. Nothing you can do here. Let's get a safe distance away. I already called this in when I saw it from my field a few minutes ago. I drove over to see if I could do anything. I hop the drainage trench alongside the road and climb up into the truck. A momentary shock of pain extends up my leg and then dissipates as the signal fades out in my brain. Maybe my fall did significant damage after all. The man drives down the road a stretch, well past the house, and then pulls off the road and into the pasture through a shallow part of the ditch. That house is lost. Fire is a real danger out here. It might seem like an obvious statement, but the age of these houses, the dry climate, the distance from significant emergency services, very much hope of putting a fire like this out. Were you inside when it started? The man asks me, eyeing my disheveled appearance. I'm still wearing scrubs, but I lost the sandals somewhere along the way. So much for my clothes and wallet. Inside? Yeah, I was inside. We smelled smoke and ran for it. I jumped out a window. We? Were the Suttons all home? Did they get out? I didn't see anyone else. I didn't see anyone else outside when I drove up, he asks, the sound of fear picking up in his voice. I don't know. I meant I smelled smoke. I meant I smelled smoke. The Suttons were home, but I don't know where anyone when, where anyone is now. The car is gone, so someone may have left. I looked around after I got out, but I didn't see anyone. That's not true. I did see someone. I'm not going to correct it. It won't matter in the long run. Maybe someone was injured and they left for the hospital. You were lucky to have gotten out when you did. I'm going to head over and make a sweep around the house, see if I can find anyone else. Are you okay to stay here alone? I'm fine. I'll come with you, I say. My name is Eric, by the way. Eric, my name is Jack. Sorry to meet you under these circumstances. Jack hops out of his truck, out his side of the truck, and makes his way around. Me too. I jump out and trot to catch up to Jack. He walks briskly and then breaks into a jog. I keep up with him. When we get close enough to the house to feel the heat, we hear the first sirens of emergency responders. I wonder if Rachel calls it in or if this is from Jack's call. We circle the entire house, and Jack sees Frank's body. He curses under his breath and grabs my sleeve to pull me towards the road. We run out and cross the road to get away from the heat. When the sheriff pulls up next to us, shortly after the sheriff comes the first of the volunteer firefighters. Jack and I return to his truck in order to get out of the way. Jack drops the tailgate on his truck and offers me a seat. I hop up and crawl into the. I hop up and crawl into the bed of the truck, taking up a position sitting on the left wheel tire tire well hump so I can watch the firefight. Due to the time it took for everyone to show up, efforts are directed toward preventing the flames from spreading to the pastures, the shed, and the barn. The house is a total loss. Everyone could tell when they showed up. What a shame, Jack says. He's standing on the passenger side of the vehicle, leaning against the wall of the bed. <clears throat> I don't say anything, but I disagree with Jack. It's no shame from my point of view. The fatal virus that was no more than a few months away from an epidemic outbreak has been destroyed. Those responsible are hopefully destroyed along with it. The only shame is that I don't know, and might not ever know if they were. More than just a shame is that my family had to be destroyed. What will I do now? Pretty soon the authorities here will start asking me questions. They'll want to know who I am, what I was doing here, who else was here, if I have any idea of how the fire started. What do I tell them? I couldn't give them the truth, but they wouldn't. <clears throat> I could give them the truth, but they won't believe it. Not until they take me to the hospital and try to run some vitals and lab work on me. Then I'll go back under observation, just like Dr. Sutton had planned for me. I don't think I like that idea. But what other options do I have? The sheriff's car is moving. The cruiser pulls gingerly off the road and into the field, coming to a stop alongside Jack's pickup. I have two options. Lie and possibly get some semblance of a normal life back, or tell the truth and live in a cage. The self-preservation instinct is powerful. I think I heard that recently. I fully understand it right now. It's the end of that one. Getting ready to see if I got any major plot holes here. I don't remember how, I don't remember the specifics, but so far I've read a couple of things where I think, I don't think I connected the dots properly. So, two more chapters to find out. Under our skin, we're all skeletons. We bleed the same blood, we breathe the same air. We need the same love, we need the same love, we need the same love, we are.